Okay, I want to take an opportunity here to explain just one of the ways that I read scripture and how I understand it. Oftentimes when people in the church are reading through scripture, we treat it almost as if the author is a little schizophrenic. Like when we read through the gospels, sometimes it's like, okay, he tells this story and then he just randomly tells this story and then he just says this story and then he says this story. And because in our Bibles, it's split up in different paragraphs and different headers and chapters and verses, and we just read it as if it's all disconnected stories. But it's not. The stories in the Gospels are all very connected to one another, and there's a reason that the author of whichever Gospel you're reading decided to put those stories next to each other. They're not always in chronological order. Oftentimes, they're not in chronological order, and it's because the writer is trying to make a point. He's trying to get you to see something, but then we don't see what he wants us to see because we split it up into all these different stories and we ignore the big picture. So we need to look at the big picture. Why is he putting this story next to this story next to this story? And I'm going to look at Mark 14, 1 to 11 as an example of this, but really this is the way you should read all of Scripture but especially in the Gospels. In Mark 14, 1 through 11, it would appear to be three separate stories. Verses 1 to 2 appear to be one story. Verses 3 to 9 appear to be a second story. And verses 10 and 11 appear to be a third story. But actually, it's all one story. I mean, in reality, the entire chapter is all one story. In reality, the entire book is all one story. But here's my point. Verses 1 through 11, sometimes we'll read it and we'll be like, okay, the... the Priests were doing this, and then Jesus did this, and then Judas did this. But it actually, the reason these are in this order is because Mark is trying to explain what happened and why it happened. It was now only two days before the Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread. The leading priests and teachers of the law were trying to find a trick to arrest Jesus and kill him. But they said, we must not do it during the feast because the people might cause a riot. Okay, that's story number one. Next verse. Jesus was in Bethany at the house of Simon the leper. While Jesus was reclining, a woman approached him with an alabaster jar filled with very expensive perfume made of pure nard. She broke open the jar and poured the perfume on Jesus' head. Some who were there became upset and said to each other, Why waste that perfume? It was worth a full year's work. It could have been sold and the money given to the poor. And they got very angry with the woman. Jesus said, leave her alone. Why are you troubling her? She did an excellent thing for me. You will always have the poor with you and you can help them anytime you want, but you will not always have me. This woman did the only thing she could do for me. She poured perfume on my body to prepare me for burial. I tell you the truth, wherever the good news is preached in all the world, what this woman has done will be told and people will remember her. It seems disconnected to the brief story we heard right before that about the priests looking for a way to arrest and kill Jesus. And then Mark says in verse 10, one of the 12 apostles, Judas Iscariot, went to talk to the leading priests to offer to hand Jesus over to them. These priests were pleased about this and promised to pay Judas money, so he watched for an opportunity to betray him. Now we can see how that seems like maybe it's connected to the first story, but it's got this weird story in between. Why is that story just dropped in there? Here's one of the things when you're reading the Gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are all telling the same story from different perspectives. Some of them include more details than others, and others leave out some details. But all of them are telling the same story. And when you have overlapping stories, you can gather some more information one from the other. So for example, Jesus says about this woman who pours perfume, wherever the good news is preached in all the world, what this woman has done will be told and people will remember her. In Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, this story is told. And so if we go and we look at this story in those other accounts, we can get a little bit more information. For the purpose of this video, we're going to look at John's account. She poured the perfume on Jesus' feet, and then she wiped his feet with her hair, and the sweet smell from the perfume filled the whole house. Judas Iscariot, one of Jesus' disciples who would later betray him, was there. Judas said, 
This perfume was worth an entire year's wages. Why wasn't it sold and the money given to the poor? But Judas did not really care about the poor. He said this because he was a thief. He was the one who kept the money bag and he often stole from it. So there, John is providing us with a little bit more detail about what's going on. Because in Mark, all he says is that some people there got upset and they were angry with the woman. But John is saying it was Judas who got upset. And Judas got upset because she could have donated this oil. It would have been worth a lot of money. And Judas was stealing that money. So they had a bag of money that they would collect money and give to the poor. And Judas was stealing that money. And he got upset. Judas is the one who is rebuking this woman. And he's doing it because he wanted to steal that money. And that's why Jesus says, leave her alone. Why are you bothering her? Now it makes sense. If you go back to Mark and you see that he puts these stories back to back, the priests are looking for a way to arrest Jesus, but they can't figure it out. Judas gets upset at this woman and Jesus rebukes him for it. And then Judas goes and decides to betray Jesus for money. We see more of the picture there. This is a very simple example, but my point is we need to be able to look at the full picture in order to understand. The writers don't just throw random stories at us. They have a reason that they put them in the order they put them. And that's true for all of the Gospels. And really, when you're reading the epistles too, they're not jumping around from topic to topic to topic like somehow we read them. They're saying things in an order that makes sense if you really pay attention to the big picture. And sometimes you have to go look up the Greek words to understand that your translation's not really conveying what they were actually saying. But if you do a little bit of homework, a little bit of legwork on it, you can always see that they're not just jumping around the way that we think they are. It's a very organized thought process. And that's what we see here with Mark. This is just a simple example to show Mark was not throwing random stories at us. It was an organized thought process. We need to look at the big picture in order to see the thought process because it's the point of what the writer is saying that is important. A lot of times when we read scripture, we treat it like reading it in and of itself is the point. We just need to get the words into our head and that's all that matters. That's actually exactly what the Pharisees were doing. Jesus told the Pharisees, you carefully study the scriptures because you think they give you eternal life. They do, in fact, tell about me, but you refuse to come to me to have that life. Oftentimes we read scripture exactly like the Pharisees. We carefully study it, but we treat it like the scriptures in and of themselves, just getting those words into our head will give us life. But we need to come to Jesus to have life, and in order to come to him, we need to understand what we're reading. My point is when we read the Bible, we can't just read it for the sake of reading it and we can't piecemeal it into these little sections. Oftentimes the reason why we piecemeal it is because we are just reading it for the sake of reading it and we're not actually trying to understand. All of scripture explains the rest of scripture. If you read one paragraph, the rest of scripture explains it but you will never come to actually understand that paragraph until you really understand what scripture as a whole is saying. And the only way you can do that is if you stop reading just one paragraph and you start reading all of scripture. So for example, if you just read Mark 14 and you didn't get around to reading John 12 for five months or more or a year or more, you wouldn't have understood why Mark put those stories next to each other. It would have just seemed like he put these random things next to each other. You wouldn't have really understood it. It would have seemed dry to you and you would have set it down and just continued on with your day. But when you are reading scripture enough to connect those dots, then you read that and you're like, oh wow, Judas betrayed Jesus because he was looking out for his own interests. He was stealing money. He loved money. And he was offended that Jesus rebuked him for it. Whoa, there's a reason Judas went and betrayed Jesus. I'd never caught that before. And that's the sort of thing we can catch 
when we are really paying attention to scripture and we're reading enough of it to start understanding the full context, the whole of scripture explains the rest of scripture. I hope you understand what I mean when I say that. I just mean basically you need to get to the point where you are familiar with scripture as a whole in order to understand the little bits that you're reading. Because if you don't understand the big picture, you're going to misinterpret the small little items. And that is what most Christians do. They miss the big picture. They focus on the small little verses and they come to a completely wrong understanding of what they think it says. Growing up in the church, I had pastors telling me all the time, you need to look at the context. You need to look at the context. You need to know like, why is the writer writing this? And who is he writing to? And you need to understand these big things. And I was always like, yeah, but how am I supposed to know that? And it's simple. You don't know it your first time, but you'll know it eventually. Just keep reading and keep reading and keep reading because it doesn't take long for you to begin to know those things because you've just read it enough. Read the Bible in order to learn and change and do what it says and to understand it and be taught by it and read it a lot. Those two things will help you to understand scripture better.